This is Douglas Kerr with Digital Transmission and Switching. This module is Cable Transmission. In it, we will learn how the first level digital signal is transmitted over cable pairs. The die group digital signal can be transmitted over various different transmission media to meet different needs within a telephone plant. The most fundamental and earliest transmission medium used for digital transmission is pairs in conventional telephone cable. We'll next take a look at how the signal is actually prepared for transmission over such cable pairs. The first question that the designers had to address is what form should the actual ones and zeros be put electrically for transmission over cable pairs? One possible format that was considered is the so-called non-return to zero format. Non-return to zero is a term drawn from the recording of digital telemetry data. But it means that the ones and zeros would be represented as two different voltages. And that the voltage would be sustained for the entire duration assigned to a particular bit. And then would change to the voltage representing the next bit without, for example, returning to some neutral value in between. It turned out, however, there were some disadvantages to the use of this for the transmission of our digital signal. One problem is that if the signal being transmitted had a long series of ones in it, or a long series of zeros, now remember we did some things in the encoding to prevent a long series of zeros from ever happening, but a long series of ones is certainly possible. If we had a long series of ones or zeros, the signal would be just a straight line, a fixed voltage. The receiving end would not be able to see any structure in such a signal, and it wouldn't be able to determine where one bit started and the next bit stopped. That is, it would be unable to, to recover sync timing for bits. So that would be one disadvantage of using this very simple non-return to zero method. There's another serious problem. We would like to be able to transmit the digital signal through capacitor coupling in the circuitry of our digital equipment. And we would like to be able to couple it to the actual transmission pairs by means of transformers. These transformers can take the unbalanced circuitry used inside the electronic equipment and convert it to the balanced form used for transmission over a pair and can provide isolation against foreign voltages getting into the equipment and can also serve a useful purpose that we'll see later having to do with remote repeaters. Transformers, of course, cannot convey or pass zero frequency or DC components, nor can they pass extremely low frequencies. Note that a signal such as this could actually have a DC component. If over any period of time there were more ones than zeros, the average of the signal would be non-zero, and that corresponds to the presence of a DC component. Or relatively long bursts of ones or zeros would themselves introduce extremely low frequency signals. These would not go through the transformers that we would like to be able to use in our circuit design. Let's see, in fact, what would happen. If we took this signal and tried to send it through a transformer that had limited low frequency response, and to get really good low frequency response in a transformer, it has to be made large and heavy and expensive. We find the following phenomenon would occur because of the limited low frequency response of the transformer. The signal might start here all right, and it would make this transition to negative. But while the signal held at a fixed negative voltage, its magnitude would sort of sag or decline because the transformer cannot sustain a voltage steadily. Now this transition to positive would occur, but now the signal would also decline here and so forth. Here this long string of ones would cause the signal to decline a great deal. Now the receiving end to tell a one for zero from a zero must make some decision. Any voltage above a certain point is considered to be a one and below a certain point would be a zero. Because keep in mind, there will be other noise and distortion caused to this signal, 
in the course of its passage down the cable. We've shown an ideal version here. We'll note that if the receiving end used zero voltage as its decision point for what is a binary one and what is a binary zero, the signal here, while it's a solid binary one, is so close to the line that just a little bit of noise on it could make it look as though it were a zero. Another way to look at this is that the reference line of the original signal, the zero on the graph, is itself kind of drooping up and down. The zero line is kind of doing this. The zero line here is sagging until it's really down here. When this phenomenon first was studied in connection with submarine telegraph transmission many years ago, engineers gave it the name zero wander for that very reason. And you'll see it described that way still in literature today about digital transmission. So because of the problem of recovering bit synchronization or bit timing, and because of the zero wander problem, the very simple non-return to zero transmission method was discarded and is not used today in digital transmission in telephone networks. <clears throat> what is used for transmission over cable pairs is a format that was originally called bipolar coding. And today it's actually called alternate mark inversion or AMI because bipolar has some other meanings in connection with logic circuitry. It just refers to anything where both plus and minus voltages are used. And it turns out to not be uniquely applicable to this. Still, the term appears in other parts of the literature, so we need to know that's what it's been called. Now, the principle of alternate mark inversion is this. A binary one is sent as a pulse and a binary zero is sent by a period in which there is no pulse. But there's one additional wrinkle, and that is every other pulse is sent of alternating polarity, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. The binary zeros are periods during which there is no pulse at all. How does this solve the problems we saw in the last figure? Well, remembering that our encoding system prevents long strings of zeros, but might allow long strings of ones, a long string of ones here has quite a distinctive character to it. The receiving end can easily see the individual bits and can recover from that a pattern that will tell it where all the bits are. <clears throat> the second problem of zero wander is precluded because there is no zero frequency or DC component and not even any low frequency components in this signal. Consider that over any period of time there will be on the average as many positive pulses as negative pulses since they alternate. And so the average voltage of any period of time of this waveform is zero, denoting that there is no DC component. Thus this signal can be sent through transformers or coupled through capacitors inside the pulse forming circuitry of digital equipment without any of the problems that we saw. Therefore, alternate mark inversion or AMI is in fact the format used to transmit our digital die group signal over a cable pair. The pulses are on the order of three volts in magnitude. I've shown the pulses here as nice and rectangular in actual fact they're somewhat rounded because such a sharp pulse contains high frequency components that we're not interested in having on the cable. So it's actually a little smoother than this. Notice that the pulse is about half as wide as the interval allocated to it. That's referred to as its duty cycle. We say that this pulse has a duty cycle of 50%. The pulse is there for about half the time, but there's an idle period of about the other half of the time. It turns out there's a third advantage of AMI. Keeping in mind that every other pulse is supposed to be of alternate polarity, we have an opportunity for the receiving end to observe whether bit errors have occurred in transmission. In other words, if every other received pulse is not of alternating polarity, the received end will recognize that as, as illegal. Now, why do we want to be able to detect bit errors? It would be nice if we could correct them, but this doesn't give us the capability to do that. <clears throat>
What it does allow, however, is that the receiving end of a transmission system can watch the rate at which bit errors occur in order to be alerted to a degradation of the transmission facility. For example, a bad splice or some type of serious interference from power lines that causes the bit error rate to rise very rapidly on a transmission medium carrying a digital system will degrade the transmission performance. But the receiving end, even just from the signal normally transmitted in service, will be able to detect if there are bit errors because they disturb the orderly pattern of alternating pulses. This can be used to bring an alarm which get, brought, draws attention to the fact that a particular system may need to be taken out of service or that some surveillance may need to be given to the actual transmission medium. Let's look in a little more detail how the receiving end is in fact able to recover bit timing from the one pulses of an AMI signal. Here we see an AMI signal as it might be received after passing through a length of cable. Actually, it would be a lot more difficult to follow than we've seen here, but I've cleaned it up a little bit to make it easier for us to understand what's going on. As the signal would come into the receiving apparatus, whatever it is, it would first be run through a clipper or equivalent circuit, which would just square it up or clean it up, as we would say. We then take the cleaned up signal and run it through a full wave rectifier circuit so that all of the pulses are in the same direction, all positive now, even though they had been alternatingly positive and negative as they came in over the line. We now take those pulses and apply it to what's called a ringing circuit. And the word ringing has nothing to do with telephone ringers, but it's ringing in the same sense that a bell is said to ring. In other words, it is a resonant circuit, and that resonant circuit is tuned to oscillate at the 1.544 megahertz frequency corresponding to the rate of the pulse intervals in our signal. What the ringing circuit does is it provides a continuous sine wave synchronized to these pulses, but bridging over the gaps between them. It's a little bit as though we had a pendulum or perhaps a child's swing. And every so often, we would push the swing to give it energy. But if we took a rest and didn't push for a couple of cycles, it would continue to swing. The ringing circuit works exactly that way. Now, the ringing circuit does something else for us. Again, thinking of our child's swing, if we wanted to change the phase timing of the swing, perhaps to get two children's swings to swing together, we find that it would be quite difficult to change the timing. We'd have to really work sort of hard to change the actual time relationship of a given swing. Similarly, in our ringing circuit in a digital system, these pulses might actually not all arrive at exactly the ideal time. They might have what's called pulse jitter as a result of distortion and interference on the transmission medium. But the stiffness, as we say, of the ringing circuit, that is its unwillingness to change its phase, averages those out. And what we end up with is a sine wave of somewhat varying amplitude whose phase is the average of the arrival times of the pulses which are really there and is not disturbed at all by the fact that where there are zero pulses, there are in fact no pulses at all. We now take the output of this ringing circuit and run it through another clipper or squaring circuit to make a rectangular wave. And by such techniques as differentiation and clipping, we end up with a bunch of pulses that would be at each of the positive going transitions of, the, of this wave. This train of pulses then becomes a clock signal, which the receiving apparatus can use to re-examine the line signal to tell whether it is a one or a zero at each point, because these pulses mark the time intervals at which a one would be expected if it was going to be there. We'll find that this bit timing recovery circuit is used in many important pieces of apparatus in digital signals,
always wherever the signal is received having been through a section of cable. Now let's look at the working of one of the other special features of AMI, this error detection feature, which allows the receiving apparatus to be continually aware of the possibility that the rate of bit errors on the cable had begun to rise above its normal value. Here we're going to represent the transmitted stream of bits as generated by the multiplexer, 1, 1, 0, 1, and so forth. And in the next line, we're showing the way it would be coded online under the AMI format, plus, minus, zero, plus, zero, zero, minus, and so forth. Let's assume that at these instants where we have marked the X, that a noise burst on the line has caused the pulse to be erroneously interpreted by the next receiving apparatus. In other words, a zero voltage was sent here, but a noise burst made it look like it was plus. Here, a minus voltage was sent, but a noise burst canceled it and made it look like a zero. And here, a plus pulse was sent, but a really big noise burst overcame it and made it look like a minus. Now, let's look at what the receiving apparatus would make out of this. It would see a plus here and interpret it as a binary one, a minus it would interpret as a binary one. Here it would see a plus, which would interpret as a binary one. That's not true, but it doesn't know that yet. Here, however, it sees a plus that nothing had happened to, but at this point it realizes that something has gone wrong. It's seen two pluses in a row, and that's not legal, so it knows there was an error. Now, it doesn't know whether it was here or here, and we don't care. We just want to be alert to the fact that errors are occurring. This illegal sequence of pulse, which I've marked here with the signal V, is called a bipolar violation. Not an AMI violation? No, it had been called bipolar violation when the signal was called bipolar and people got used to the name. So a bipolar violation is the illegal occurrence of two pulses in sequence that have the same polarity something that never legitimately happens in an AMI signal. Now, a little further along, we see that we had an error occurring here. Uh, this should have been a minus pulse. It wasn't. The receiver doesn't yet know anything has gone wrong. But when this perfectly good one pulse is received as a plus, the last pulse it saw was a plus way back here. And seeing two in a row is again illegal. It pays no attention to the fact that it thought this one was illegal. Having done so, it forgets that and now just compares adjacent pulses. So this is plus, this is plus, and it blows the whistle again here. Now as we get farther along to the signal, in this point where we had a more severe error, this plus pulse is changed into minus. The last pulse the receiver saw was minus. It sees this as minus and it says, wow, that's illegal. Interestingly enough, this is a perfectly good minus pulse that gets through without incident, but because it's the same as this, it also sees that as being a violation. Now, I mentioned that the receiving apparatus keeps track of the rate at which violations occur, and if they occur more frequently than a certain preset rate, an alarm condition is brought in to warn technical personnel that the transmission medium may be in trouble. Notice here that a single line error causes two counts. This is probably appropriate, since it must have been an especially serious noise burst to change the received pulse all the way from a positive pulse to a negative pulse. Thus, such severe noise bursts are automatically counted more heavily in the alerting process. Let's review what we've heard about the way in which our digital signal is transmitted over a physical cable pair. The transmission format is alternate mark inversion, known as AMI, sometimes called the bipolar format. In this format, a binary one is transmitted as a pulse, and a binary zero by means of the absence of a pulse. Every alternate one pulse has opposite polarity. This eliminates any DC component in the signal, which would preclude its transmission through coupling capacitors or line transformers. It also provides a rich uh, 
stream of transitions from which receiving circuitry can recover bit timing. The AMI format has an additional advantage in that it allows us automatically to monitor in service the error performance of the transmission medium. Any error in the transmission facility will cause an impossible sequence of received pulses, in particular two consecutive pulses of the same polarity. This illegal format, known as a bipolar violation, is a sure indication of a transmission error, and monitoring the rate of their occurrence can alert us to dig degradation in the performance of the transmission channel. What determines the rate at which we can send pulses down a cable pair? Again, we have the work of Harry Nyquist, that eminent mathematician who brought so much to the theory of digital transmission, to thank for our theoretical understanding of this issue. Nyquist said, the maximum rate of transmission of pulses through a band-limited channel without interference between the pulses is twice the channel bandwidth. Let's look at each of the phrases in that and see what they mean. A band-limited channel is, of course, one that can only transmit a finite range of frequencies, just like a regular telephone transmission channel can only transmit frequencies up to perhaps 3,500 hertz. When we say without interference between the pulses, we mean the following. Uh, when a pulse is transmitted through a channel that has a limited frequency response, the, there is some hangover, almost like echo of the pulse, and the pulse that's received lasts longer than the pulse that's transmitted. If it lasts until the next pulse comes along, then the echo of the first pulse will disturb the interpretation of the second pulse, and that's what Nyquist is talking about. He's saying, what are the conditions so that one pulse would not interfere with the next? We'll look at that a little more shortly. The channel bandwidth is, of course, the frequency that the channel could handle, the highest frequency in this case that it could handle. So what this implies is that if we had some kind of a transmission medium which could handle frequencies up to 100,000 hertz, we might expect to be able to send 200,000 pulses per second over that channel in such a way that one would not interfere with the other. Let's look at what that means a little more closely. Here we see an oscillograph trace of some illustrative square pulse. It occurs at a time on the time axis that we'll call T sub P, the time of the pulse. And it has a width T, the number of microseconds, for example, uh, in the width of the pulse. If we were to examine this pulse with a spectrum analyzer, that's an instrument that shows what frequencies are contained in the waveform. Remember, an oscilloscope shows its history in time, but a spectrum analyzer would show what frequencies are buried in this pulse. We would see an envelope like this. This pulse contains some energy at zero frequency. Sure, it's above the axis. Its average is not zero. There's some DC in it. That's what this means. This is the origin. And we find that it contains energy all the way up to infinite frequency. But there are certain places, multiples of the frequency that are one over the width of the pulse in which there is no energy. Now let's take this pulse and pass it through a band-limited channel. And in particular, it would be a channel that could only transmit frequencies up to a frequency, F max, of 2 over T. In other words, if the width of the pulse were 1 microsecond, then 2 divided by that would be 2 megahertz. Uh, if we run through this band-limited channel and send just one pulse through it, what comes out at the distant end of the channel looks like the solid curve. Now you say, how can this be? Something comes out before the pulse even started. Remember, the transmitted pulse was from about here to here. Well, that's because we've examined an ideal band-limited channel that has certain tidy mathematical properties that you actually couldn't build.
In fact, this is how we know you couldn't build it, because it would do something we know is impossible, have a signal coming out before anything went in. It nevertheless allows us to understand the theoretical predictions of performance. So taking for granted these impossibilities, we see that this incoming pulse would come out looking like this. Notice that it's several times after the center of the pulse there's a time at which the output voltage passed through zero, although the output voltage does kind of oscillate or ring and produce a hangover of the signal. If we sent another pulse, another bit of a binary word, at exactly this point in time, its peak would come out of the channel at just the time when the hangover from the original pulse was passing through zero. As a result, at this point in time, the receiver would have no difficulty interpreting whether the second pulse was there or not, since there would be no evidence of the original pulse at that particular point in time. This is a practical application of Nyquist's concept of the rate of transmission of pulses through a band-limited channel. Now, the rate at which we send pulses for our die-group digital signal is 1.5 four, four megahertz, megabits per second. And so we know that we have to have a channel whose bandwidth is approximately half that. In other words, something that can handle frequencies up over 700 kilohertz to be able to transmit the signal. Now, can we send a 700 kilohertz signal over a cable pair? Yes, we can. It's attenuated very rapidly. It's distorted very rapidly, but we nevertheless can do it. And in fact, that is exactly what we do do in transmission of our die group signal over a cable pair. I want to talk now about what is perhaps the most important single concept from which digital transmission gets its power to economically perform transmission jobs for us. When we transmit a signal in analog form down a cable, it picks up distortion and noise and some perhaps unpredictable attenuation. We put in amplifiers or repeaters to build up the loss of signal, but any noise or distortion is still with us and we're stuck with it and any noise that accumulates in the first section of cable will be added to by noise in the second section of the cable and the third section of the cable, and it accumulates the entire way. If we run an analog signal all the way across the United States, it may have to go through several thousand repeaters. Any distortion in any of those repeaters is with us at the end. So that means that for analog transmission systems, the repeaters must be extremely precise. Their amplification must be very precise. They must be totally free of distortion. And we have to put up with the possible accumulation of noise through thousands of miles of cable. In a digital situation, we enjoy a dramatically different circumstance. At the sending end of a digital transmission system, we send a train of pulses, ones and zeros, which encode the signal. A mile or so down the line, we may have to take those signals and receive them with a repeater because of attenuation in the cable. But as long as that repeater can correctly discern which are ones and which are zeros, even though the signal might be badly distorted, that signal is received with no degradation at the repeater. The repeater can then send on its way properly timed, proper amplitude, proper shaped one pulses or absences of pulses for zeros. And by doing so, our signal is completely cleaned of all of the distortion and noise it acquired in the first cable section. It is forgiven for everything that happened to it. Another mile or so down the line, we may have to have another repeater. But as long as it can correctly tell a one from a zero, there is no discrepancy in the signal. And it can again send the signal on its way exactly like the signal that was originally generated by the transmitting terminal. Thus, noise and distortion acquired in the cable do not add up along the entire length. And in fact, even small discrepancies in the size of the pulses transmitted by a particular repeater 
are completely forgiven so long as they're not serious enough to make the next repeater misunderstand which are ones and which are zeros. This means that the care that must be taken in the precision of the components or the alignment of the repeaters is far less in a digital repeater than an analog repeater. And this accounts for the greater economy of the construction of digital repeaters. It also means that the transmission performance of a digital system is largely unaffected by how long the cable is. And this gives us great flexibility in designing our telephone networks. So it is the enormous power of regeneration, the forgiveness of a signal for all its discrepancies at each repeater, which leads to the benefits of digital transmission. Of course, if we have interference bad enough to cause bit errors, they do cause noise to be introduced. We discussed that earlier. And that can be held to a, an acceptable level by proper design of the transmission facilities. Let's see now what these repeaters are which take advantage of this marvelous concept. Here we see what's called a regenerative repeater, a circuit that will receive a train of bits transmitted in AMI form, decide which are ones and which are zeros, and send them on their way exactly in the standard form that they were when they left the sending end. The cable pair enters the repeater at this point and comes in through a transformer. It's nice that we can do that. That's why we picked AMI. And in fact, we're going to use that to provide some isolation and also to take care of a thing we'll talk about later, which is how to get power to this repeater to run it. The signal comes in next through a thing called a line build-out network. The repeaters are designed to compensate for the loss in a certain length of cable. We'll talk about what that is shortly. Not only the loss, but the fact that the loss varies with frequency. The loss is, of course, greater, higher in the frequency spectrum. If for convenience of physical layout, we must have a cable section shorter than the standard amount, we replace the missing piece of cable by a sort of an artificial line called a line build-out network which again produces a total attenuation and a frequency response at this point, equivalent to a standard cable section. Some of the more modern repeaters have a sort of an automatic gain control, which observes the size of the pulses and adjusts the line build-out network actively to produce compensation for the actual length of cable that's involved. The signals now run through a preamplifier to bring them back to standard size. We, it turns out that one cable section from one repeater to the next may have a loss of as much as 30 dB. So the signals are pretty small, and we just build them back up to a big enough size to work with. We then send the signals into our timing recovery circuit, the swing, the ringing circuit that we saw on the previous picture, to derive a clock which predicts where the pulses are supposed to be if they are going to be pulses. The repeater then uses a sample gate to look at the received signal. You see, here's the transmitted signal. The received signal comes in messed up. Again, if you actually looked at it on oscilloscope, you wouldn't even be able to interpret it yourself. I've made it look a little nicer here so we can follow the story. And the sampling pulses tell this sample gate when to look at this in the middle of the pulse intervals to decide if it's a 1 or a 0, or in fact, to decide if it's plus minus or zero voltage. You see, here the sample gate would decide this was plus, here it would decide it was zero, here it would decide it was minus, here it would decide it was plus, here it was zero, here it was minus. And it then stores those in the form of logic pulses, which are passed forward to a pulse generator. The pulse generator then makes standard sized, standard shape, precisely timed AMI pulses feeds them out through another one of our little inexpensive transformers and onto the cable pair heading down to the next repeater. Notice that the logic signal here keeps track of whether the received pulse was a plus or a minus and sends it on just as such. This repeater makes no attempt to correct bipolar violations. There wouldn't be any point to it. And in fact, it just passes them on through so that errors that occurred here will be able to be observed at the distant end at the receiving terminal in order to become aware 
of the problem. Now this, of course, only shows transmission in one direction. Although I didn't mention it, in these digital systems, we transmit in the two directions over two separate cable pairs, one from west to east and one from east to west. And so any particular regenerative repeater really consists of two sets of all this circuitry, one for the eastbound transmission and one for the westbound. They're normally mounted on the same plug-in card and go in the same housing, but they're quite separate except for the power feeding arrangements, which we'll talk about in a minute. It's so the principle of the regenerative repeater for digital transmission over cable pairs. Let's talk a little bit about power feed. Uh, it turns out that these repeaters are going to be a little over a mile apart, and it certainly isn't practical at those intervals to provide a regular central office type power plant with batteries and rectifiers and commercial power. Instead, we feed power to the repeaters from the nearest central office over the cable pairs themselves. A little hint is given to that here, which suggests that a lead somehow comes in from the cable it goes to a power supply unit. What this really is is a power converter. It takes a certain current that's fed through here and derives from it whatever voltages the particular circuit designer needs. Perhaps it would be plus and minus five volts DC and then maybe a plus three volts or something. Whatever that is, that's done in this unit, which is really a power converter. Let's look a little more at some of the choices that we have in applying this concept of feeding power to a repeater. We can, of course, only feed power to a certain number of repeaters in a row. There's a voltage drop through the resistance of the cable. A certain amount of voltage is consumed by the repeater in using the power to run itself. And at a certain point, we just run out of voltage. So for example, in a length of cable running between two central offices, we might feed about half of the repeaters from one office and the other half from the other one. They would all be fed from the nearest office. We see here some of the possibilities that would exist inside the repeater for dealing with this. Inside the repeater, there is some kind of a little option switching arrangement. This might be a switch that's moved in different positions. It might be straps that you move. It might be little plugs that you plug over some pins in different combinations, or it might be those wonderful little screw switches that you screw down on some lands in the circuit board two or three times until the lands fall off. But whatever, it allows us to arrange differently the way the power feed current goes through the repeater. This represents the two cable pairs carrying this particular digital signal, one eastbound and one westbound. We're going to be treating them together now. And this represents the two cable pairs transmitting the signal to the east and bringing the signal in from the east. If this is not the last repeater in the group which is being fed power from a central office, let's assume that the current is being sent from this end. The current is sent through both the tip and the ring conductors of the cable in parallel. It's fed in at the office through a center tap on the transformer, just as we see here, what is sometimes called a simplex connection, so that the two conductors both share the current. At the repeater, the DC is brought out from the begin middle of this transformer winding. The secondary actually carries the pulses into the repeater circuitry itself. The path is led through the power supply or power converter, and in our case, through the switches set in the through condition and on out to the next repeater down the line. If we were the last repeater in the line being fed power from this end, we would instead set our switch so that the current came in through here, through our power supply, went around through this little strap, and went back over the westbound conductor to ultimately reach ground at the central office. You might think that the cable section in the very middle of this whole run, the one between the last repeater fed from the west and the one and the last repeater fed from the east, would not have to have any current going through it at all. And it wouldn't insofar as feeding the repeaters is concerned. But there's another consideration. 
Many of the cables used for digital transmission were installed before digital transmission systems. They were used for metallic trunks. Loop current would flow through the conductors under normal conditions. And splices, which might not be perfectly solid, would be held quiet by the passage of the DC loop current. The same thing is true in here, in that the power feed current helps keep those splices stuck together and avoids them getting noisy. If we allowed no power feed current in the middle cable section of a run between two central offices, the splices in there might get noisy. So it is traditional to carry the power feed loop beyond the last repeater that's fed down to the next one in the line and then just turn it around and send it back in order that those cable conductors become included in the path in the interest of keeping the splices quiet. This is how we feed power to regenerative repeaters not located in central office buildings. Let's talk now how all these different parts of a system are actually put together and look at the architecture of a complete digital transmission system. We'll introduce some terminology that will be used repeatedly in connection with the application of digital systems. One of the first terms that we'll talk about is T1 carrier. When digital systems were first introduced, it was in the form of a complete packaged end-to-end -end system, including the encoding and quantizing apparatus, the time division multiplexing, and a means to transmit the signal over a conventional trunk cable pair. And this system was named the T1 carrier system, carrier being a synonym for a multiplex transmission system that had been with the telephone industry for quite a while. Later, it was determined that the units which do the encoding and first level multiplexing of the signal could be used in other contexts than that of transmission over cable pairs. And so the scope of the term T1 carrier was compressed somewhat until it now refers only to the systems used to transmit a die group signal over the cable pairs. The portions of the system which do the encoding and the first level multiplexing for a die group are now known as a digital channel bank. Here we see how these different units are assembled together and how they are discussed. <clears throat> At the two ends of a system, we see here a symbol that represents the digital channel bank, which takes the 24 channels, encodes them into digital form, and puts them into a single die group digital system signal. This symbol represents the regenerative repeaters that we discussed before, which pick up the signals after it traveled through some cable interprets the ones and zeros, reconstructs them, and sends them on as fresh signals. The portion of cable between where a signal is generated and where it's received, such as from here to the first regenerative repeater, or from the first to the second repeater, is known as a section, a cable section. These dots represent a standard interface at which the digital signal is brought to a standard form for cross-connecting purposes. And that standard form of the signal is known as the DS1 signal, the digital signal level one. The portion of the transmission system extending from one of these DS1 signal points to another is called a span. And the actual physical points at which the connections are made here are known as DSX1 points, digital signal cross-connect points. A span is a self-contained piece of a transmission system which can be administered as an entity. For example, if there is some flaw in this span, such as the failure of a regenerative repeater, another spare span which may exist from this point to another may be patched in at these DSX1 points to replace it without any prior prearrangement. All first level spans are interchangeable. 
The arrangements for feeding power remotely to the regenerative repeaters are self-contained within a span. The adjustments of the power feed arrangements depend on the resistance of the cable pairs and so forth, and this way no readjustment would need to be made of the power feed circuits when a span is replaced. Furthermore, this avoids any DC power passing through the DSX1 cross connects. They only handle the actual digital signal pulses themselves. <clears throat> Here we see a symbol labeled as office repeater. We'll talk about that in a moment. Here we see a special symbol that indicates what's called an express repeater. Now an express repeater sounds like something fancy, but actually it's not something fancy at all. All an express repeater is, is a remote type regenerative repeater. The same kind that ordinarily would be on a pole or in a manhole that happens to live in a central office, probably in the basement. In other words, at this central office, no access is available to the span for patching or for any testing other than the kind that's done at field repeaters. In fact, this repeater doesn't even get its power from the local central office plant. It's fed power over the line just like this one or just like this one. So the name express repeater is a little bit of a misnomer. It comes from an earlier era in which it described a type of repeater that was noteworthy in that the signal came into it and went immediately out of the central office without passing through any patching or testing equipment. So again, the span is a portion of T1 carrier transmission capability, which is self-contained, includes all of its necessary repeater power feeds, and which could be substituted or replaced at this DSX1 cross-connect point. A section is the piece of cable between where a signal is generated and where it is next received, such as between a terminal and the first regenerative repeater or between two adjacent regenerative repeaters. This much then becomes a T1 carrier system, and the digital channel banks at the end are not, strictly speaking, part of the T1 system because they are not uniquely dedicated to transmission over cable they could prepare a die group signal for transmission over some other medium. Let's talk about how we decide how far apart repeaters can actually be spaced. We saw that the repetition rate of the pulses in our first level, or now we can call it DS1 signal, is 1.544 megabits per second. And the principal sine wave component in that is at half that rate, or 772 kilohertz. So it's the loss of the cable at 772 kilohertz which determines how long a section can be. Current regenerative repeaters generally will tolerate a loss of up to 31 dB at 772 kilohertz. That corresponds to about 6,000 feet of traditional 22 gauge trunk cable pair, the so-called pulp insulated pair that has a paper mache insulation, which was widely in use when the T1 system was developed. The design to meet 6,000 feet in a section was not an accident, but was chosen in order to provide a convenience of installation. Before the emergence of T1 carrier, most of these cable pairs were serving inter-office trunks on an inductively loaded basis. That is, inductive loading coils were inserted in the cable pairs every 6,000 feet to minimize attenuation and produce more uniform frequency response. That also limited the frequency response of the cable pairs to about 3,500 hertz. When those cable pairs would be used for digital transmission, these loading coils had to be removed. But the places where loading coils existed were always made physically very handy. A large manhole, a balcony on a pole, something that was easy to get at for technicians. Therefore, the easiest thing to do when installing a T1 carrier system was to remove the loading coils and to install the repeaters at the same physical sites. <clears throat> 
Thus, the designers chose the sensitivity and gain of the repeaters, in fact, to match the 6,000 feet sections, which would be found between these physically desirable points. Now, the distance between the places where power needs to be fed is a function of the available voltage, the resistance of the cable, and in fact, the type of repeater, since different models require different amounts of current and consume different amounts of voltage. But typically, for some of the older type repeaters, 17 miles between the places where power is fed is practical. And for the newer repeaters, up to 36 miles is generally available between the central offices where power is fed over the cable conductors to the repeaters. <clears throat> Let's look at what happens when the T1 carrier system actually makes it into the central office at one end or another. It turns out that the digital channel bank, when it encodes and multiplexes 24 voice channels, delivers an output signal which, for the moment, we can consider to be exactly the standard DS1 signal which is used at the cross-connect interface. And that DS1 signal is exactly the signal which is sent onto the cable pair in T1 carrier. In other words, what comes out of the channel bank can really go on the cable pair without requiring any additional transmitting apparatus. There's a little apparatus inserted, a transformer, to provide isolation against foreign voltages and to provide a center tap so that one end of the power feed circuit can be put into this simplex connection and share the current over the two conductors. But there isn't any active circuitry in that direction. On the other hand, the receiving side of the channel bank, which receives the digital signal and demultiplexes it and decodes it back into analog form, is not sensitive enough to receive signals coming in from the cable pair directly, which are weak and badly distorted. It would be wasteful to build that into the channel bank, because in some applications, the channel bank will just be running locally from higher level demultiplexing equipment. Therefore, a half of a standard regenerative repeater is provided at the receiving end of the cable pair coming into the central office. That picks up the weakened signal, retimes it, and turns it into a standard transmitted pulse, which, as we said a moment ago, is in fact a standard DS1 signal, and delivers it to this interface point, whereupon it is led into the input of the receiving side of the channel bank. This half repeater is called an office repeater, and we saw it labeled as such on the other drawing. It only works in one direction, but the actual card on which it's mounted, or the plug-in unit, also does include this passive coupling transformer for the transmitting side. Now, I said that what comes out of the digital channel bank is almost a standard DS1 signal. Why might it not be a complete DS1 signal? Well, in a large office or terminal installation, this could be a considerable distance from a particular channel bank to the central point where this DSX1 cross-connect and patch bay exists. And the signals will suffer some attenuation and some shift of frequency response passing through this cable, which could be several hundred feet. Still, the signal voltage and pulse shape is defined at this point. And so to accommodate the loss in this cable, the digital channel bank can be set by switches or option strappings or plugs to generate a signal which is a little hotter, if we will, than the standard DS1 signal so that by the time it gets through the office cable to this point, it is at standard DS1 voltage. That's an adjustment that's made when the unit is put into service and doesn't have to be changed unless the cabling is rerun. Now, in the receiving direction, the signal arrives here out of the receiving office repeater at standard DS1 voltage and pulse shape. It will lose some amplitude and suffer some frequency distortion in passing through the office cable to the receiving digital channel bank. But the digital channel bank is able to accommodate that small discrepancy without any adjustments. So here we have standard signals. Here we have signals which are a little hotter and a little weaker than standard. 
Again, the T1 system span is defined as ending at this digital cross-connect point. Now, we've seen that we're able to have these regenerative repeaters out in the field in manholes or up on poles running without benefit of any attention and being fed power over the cable pair itself. Of course, occasionally we'll have a failure either in a repeater or due to damage to a cable. It would be extremely nice if the technicians at the central office could determine approximately where in the run from one office to another the failure had occurred before dispatching someone actually to the field to make measurements or tests of a regenerative repeater itself. To allow this, an ingenious arrangement for remote fault location was designed into the T1 carrier system and is used in the systems made by most manufacturers with slight variations between different products. Here we can see its principle. This represents the west to east branch of a particular T1 carrier span. There's, of course, an east to west branch that we'll talk about later. Here we have a special test set whose purpose is to generate signals used to locate where the flaw has occurred. What we're really going to try and find out is how far through this has the signal passed successfully before the failure has interrupted it. This test set generates a special signal which includes intentional bipolar violations. That is, intentional, intentional recurrences of pulses of the same polarity, which doesn't occur in a real signal. Of course, we only do this fault location on an out-of-service basis. The system is already defective, so it couldn't be handling traffic. We replace the span with a spare span and apply the signal from the test set to find out where the trouble is. This test set can make a number of different versions of this special signal, which differ in the rate of recurrence of these intentional bipolar violations. In each regenerative repeater, there is an output signal which has a pulse on it whenever the repeater detects a bipolar violation. I didn't show that in the repeater drawing. I said that the repeater passes the violations on, and it does, but it also notices them and gives a pulse out this little port. And all the ports for all the repeaters in one particular location are all tied together and run into a little filter which passes only a very narrow range of frequencies, the range of frequencies corresponding to one of the rates of bipolar violation insertion which this test set can generate. The output of that filter goes onto a cable pair which runs through all of the repeater locations. It's probably inductively loaded to reduce its attenuation, and it only operates in the voice frequency regime, that is, up to about 3,500 hertz. It's very similar to another pair that's provided in as an order wire for intercom use among technicians working on the system. This is another pair of the same type. Now, to begin trying to locate where the signal has been interrupted, the technician sets this test set to generate a test signal having bipolar violations at a rate corresponding to the frequency of this narrow band filter at that particular site. And if the signal is successively arriving this far, pulses will come out of this repeater at that rate, will pass through the filter and basically create a tone which the test set measures. And so the test set meter indicates that its test signal must have gotten this far. The technician then turns the switch to another position and sends out another test signal which has bipolar violations at a different rate corresponding to the frequency of this filter. Again, if the signal is getting this far, those bipolar violations will come out here at that rate, will pass through this filter, and will go back. The technician does this until at a certain test signal, he no longer gets a returned signal and knows, therefore, that the trouble must be someplace between the output of that repeater and the input of this repeater. Now, there is, of course, another direction of transmission. <clears throat> In order to test that, the technician throws a key on the test set, which applies a certain battery polarity from the central office over this pair. <clears throat> 
At each one of the repeater locations, that operates a relay or switching circuit, which flops all of these filters over to outputs from the westbound repeaters. At the same time, at the distant central office, the digital signal is looped back so that whatever makes it this far will be turned around at the DSX-1 cross-connect and come this way. And the process is just worked one stage at a time towards here by backing down through the different test signals, the pickup filters now being connected on the east to west direction. Thus, without dispatching anyone to the field, plant test personnel are able to determine in which repeater section a system malfunction has occurred. Let's review what we've learned about the T1 carrier system used to carry our digital signals over physical cable pairs. We first talked about the powerful concept of regeneration, central to the performance of digital transmission systems. Under the principle of regeneration, a signal which has suffered noise and distortion by passing through a cable section is retransmitted in exactly the same form that it was originally generated. Thus, a signal can traverse many, many regenerative repeaters with no accumulation of noise, distortion, or other transmission impairments. The nomenclature T1 carrier applies to the actual transmission system used on the cable pairs and a T1 system terminates at both ends at what's called a DSX-1 interface. At this point, the signal is in a standard electrical form known as the DS-1 signal. The span between two such interfaces is a unit which can be patched or moved around to administer or maintain transmission facilities. We looked into the concept of an office repeater, a half of a regenerative repeater found at the end of the last transmission section before arriving at a channel bank. At this point, the signal is restored to the standard DS1 electrical characteristics. We also looked at the T1 carrier fault location system, which allows plant test personnel to remotely determine in which repeater section malfunction of a system may have occurred. Thank <laughs> you.